The following is a presentation of Apologetics Press. In this session, we're going to be talking about ambiguous arguments that are often used to promote the theory of evolution, as well as having some additional discussion about fossils and some other discussion on related topics. But before we get started, I want to review where we are and where we've gotten to at this point. We've shown that true science has thoroughly refuted the theory of evolution in several areas. First, we talked about spontaneous generation, the idea promoted by evolutionists that somehow life could spontaneously arise from non-life. And we've shown that just what we now know about the incredible complexity of life and even the simplest life forms being more complicated than anything humans have ever been able to create. Uh, we've shown that saying that those simple life form forms could somehow spontaneously form is, is scientifically absurd. Uh, we also looked at the idea that somehow starting with a so-called simple life form, starting with bacteria, the idea that information could be added to the genome of that bacteria, information could be added to the DNA of that bacteria to somehow turn that bacteria into a human is also scientifically absurd. And it goes against everything we've learned, everything we've observed from true operational science. Looked at vestigial organs, the idea promoted over a century ago that somehow within humans, we had these organs and structures that were evolutionary leftovers, that they no longer had any use, no longer had any function, and that because of that, that was evidence for evolution. And we've shown that it really was not evidence for evolution, it was simply evidence for scientific ignorance. As time passed, as scientific studies were performed, we learned about vital functions for all 180 of the organs and structures originally performed proposed to be vestigial. And so that's where we're at now. What we're going to do again in this session is continue with the discussion of the fossil record. But before continuing, I want to read Romans 1.20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. And so as we go through these sessions, as we talk about God's creation, we get need to realize that God expects us to, to know of his existence, to know something of him, just from the evidence that he has given us in his creation. Now, talking about the fossil record, there are two ways to look at the fossil record. First, there would be the traditional atheistic way, the way that evolutionists look at the fossil record, and then also there would be the way that a biblical creationist could look at the fossil record. Now, if we look at an atheistic evolutionist, uh, standard explanation of the fossil record. Typically, they'll say that fossils formed over millions of years, and the order of burial within the fossil record is related to the, the time at which organisms in, evolved. In other words, if an organism is found lower in the fossil record, that means it evolved earlier. If an organism is found higher in the fossil record, that means it evolved later on. And that difference in time between the organisms in the lower regions of the fossil record and the upper regions in the view of an evolutionist, or according to their theories, could be hundreds of millions of years. They explain the lack of transitional forms because even evolutionists will admit there are very few transitional forms in one of two ways. First, they either say that uh, there's a lack of transitional forms because of imperfections in the fossil record. Somehow, we just haven't discovered the transitional forms yet, but maybe they're out there. That, that explanation is starting to lose favor because, again, we have found millions of fossils. And after finding millions of fossils, the more fossils we find, the harder it is to blame anything on imperfections in the fossil record. And so another explanation that has been proposed recently, uh, Stephen Jay Gould proposed the idea of punctuated equilibrium. What he said was the reason we don't see transitional forms in the fossil record is because evolution contrary to the general theory, doesn't progress very consistently, very gradually. Evolution occurs in, in large steps. And so he, he calls that punctuated equilibrium where rather than one organism gradually turning into another kind of organism, one organism almost instantaneously turns into that other kind of organism. And because that transition or that evolution happened so fast, again, according to Stephen Jay Gould, because it happens so fast, there's no time for transitional forms, or there's very few transitional forms that could be formed, and that's why we don't see them in the fossil record. Biblical creationism view the fossil record as really representing an order in which animals were buried during the flood. And so what we see is in the lower areas of the, the fossil column, these would be the animals whose habitats were destroyed first or who, for other reasons, were buried first in the flood. And when we look at what we find in the lower levels of the fossil column of the fossil record, that is consistent. We would expect with the fountains of the great deep bursting open with discussion about volcanic activity during the flood, uh, with those types of events occurring, we would expect the ocean environments to be destroyed first 
first, the environments on the ocean floor to be destroyed first, and those are the types of creatures that are found lowest in the fossil record. And then as we move up through the fossil column, the order at which creatures are buried would be correlated to either, again, the order at which their habitats had been flooded, habitats had been destroyed, and also related to that particular animal's or that, that particular creature's ability to flee the flood, flee the rising waters, or also the instincts that would allow it to flee the, or cause it to, to flee from the rising flood waters. The lack of transitional forms, uh, very obvious. The reason there are no transitional forms in the fossil record from a biblical viewpoint is because transitional forms never existed. Again, the God made cr original created kinds, and even though there's tremendous variation within those kinds, even though the genetic information that God put in those original created kinds allows for the tremendous variation in life that we see today, uh, there's no transitional forms between one fundamental kind of animal and another fundamental kind of animal. And so that's uh, because those transitional forms never existed, obviously we wouldn't find them in the fossil record. Now other evidence that biblical creationists will point to, uh, two other lines. First, fossils, a lot of fossils that we find are extremely well preserved. The amount of detail that we see in these fossils is such that the fossil, the animal, would have had to fossilize within days of having died. And so very rapid fossilization, certainly not years or hundreds of years for that fossilization to occur very consistent with rapid burial, rapid fossilization. We also see what they call fossil graveyards, and this is uh, areas in the world where just a tremendous agglomeration of fossils, just a tremendous deposit of fossils, very dense. This is consistent with a global flood because uh, it's very similar to when a river floods or a stream floods and we see eddy currents and we see debris caught in those eddies. During a global flood, you could also have eddies, huge eddies, again, because of the scale of the flood, uh, that would cause fossils to be concentrated, possibly deposited into these kind of jumbled fossil graveyards that we see in, in various places around the world. So again, two different views of the fossil record, very different views, uh, one the atheistic view and the other a view that's typically held by biblical creationists. Now, when we talk about claims of transitional forms, there's also two viewpoints. When a animal, when we see different or variation within a kind, uh, it can be tempting if someone is looking for evidence for evolution. They're focused on trying to find evidence or find reasons to justify claims that one type of animal turned into another type of animal. When we see variation within a kind, it can be tempting to say, well, maybe that means rather than variation within a kind that you have one entire species of animal turning into another entire species of animal. And so an example we could use here, I uh, use example a beagle, and the question would be, is a beagle a type of dog? In other words, is it simply a breed of dog? Or is it a transitional form between a Yorkie and a German Shepherd? So in other words, if we just looked at the bones and we saw a Yorkie and we saw a German Shepherd and we saw a beagle, would we recognize that as variation within a kind, which is of course what a biblical creationist would view that evidence as? Or would we be tempted to say, well, maybe that's evidence that uh, somehow this, this Yorkie is eventually gonna turn into a German Shepherd? Now, have some quotes that are relevant to that particular observation. I wanna read a quote here by Dr. David Pilbeam says, I'm also aware of the fact that at least in my own subject of paleoanthropology, theory heavily influenced by implicit ideas almost always dominates data. Ideas that are totally unrelated to actual fossils have dominated theory building, which in turn strongly influence the way fossils are interpreted. And so again, if, if the concerted effort, a uh, very large amount of energy is being made to identify transitional forms, to find a transitional form, find some evidence of one type of animal or one kind of animal turning into another kind of animal, that's gonna skew the interpretation of the fossil record. Now we use the variation within a dog kind as an example, and that may have seemed like a trivial example, but that type of thinking actually occurred in the 20th century. This is the famous horse series. The horse series was suspected to be false and or fraudulent as early as 1920, However, it was taught as fact throughout the 20th century and only recently removed from the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History. And when we take a look at the horse series, a lot of the same errors were made as if we were trying to interpret variations within the dog kind as somehow being transitional forms from one type of dog to another type of dog. We also see that in the horse series where fossils that were obviously just variations within the horse kind were somehow interpreted or, or pieced together in a way to imply that there was some kind of ongoing evolution or ongoing development of the horse. And so so again, examples of people looking for what they want to find and then thinking they have found it when in reality, in this case, people looking for transitional forms, oftentimes claiming transitional forms, uh, in reality, all they are seeing is variation within a kind. Other quotes relevant to this topic, here's a quote from Dr. Colin Patterson, 
I fully agree with your comments on the lack of direct illustration of evolutionary transitions in my book. If I knew of any, fossil or living, I would certainly have included them. You suggest that an artist should be used to visualize such transformations, but where would he get the information from? I could not honestly provide it, and if I were to leave it to artistic license, would that not mislead the reader? Now, Dr. Patterson, he's senior paleontologist of the British Museum of Natural History, so a very uh, respected scientist. And I really also want to point out, use this quote as an example to point out that most scientists are objective. Most scientists really are searching for the best interpretation of data or searching for more knowledge. And when we think about evolutionists, or we talk about this subject, a lot of times we're not, they're not speaking as scientists when they speak on the subject. They are speaking as atheists that happen to have scientific credentials. Now, in this case, Dr. Patterson, again, an excellent quote, because he's saying, no, he wants to stick to the data. He's going to present the true data. He's not going to somehow have an, have an artist create data or somehow create what he thinks might be true or what he thinks could be true. He, again, is sticking with the true data. And so, again, that's, I have to realize uh, that when we are talking about the subject, not to come across as anti-science, because again, true science is the friend of the biblical creationist. It is the enemy of the evolutionist. And so true science is our friend. We need to be respectful of true scientists, but we also need to realize that in this area, there are many atheists with scientific credentials that let their desire to promote atheism, their desire to promote evolution, dominate the scientific objectivity that they should have. Just to give it an example or several examples of this, I'm gonna talk about some of the missing links that really did, at the very least, do a gross extrapolation on the evidence or even invoked artistic license when trying to promote a certain transitional form or promote a, a certain viewpoint. This example we're gonna use next, this is Pachycetus, and I put the dates next to the, the proposed transitional forms, talk about how long it was really accepted as a transitional form, and then talk about kind of what brought about its demise, why it was no longer viewed as a transitional form. So this is Pachycetus. Quote is, uh, in time and in its morphology, Pachycetus is perfectly intermediate, a missing link between earlier land mammals and later full-fledged whales. An artist was able to devise this conception, or an artist was hired to somehow uh, devise this concept that really looks like a transitional form between a land animal and a whale. I mean, it has uh, legs that look like they're turning into flippers. It appears to be hunting food. And so again, a very powerful view a very powerful visual to try to make this case that somehow Pachycetus was a transitional form between land animals and whales. Now again, true science being the enemy of the evolutionists, what happened in 2001, additional bones had been found, additional bones were pieced together, and we see those bones and those reconstructions in the upper right of that diagram. And of course, a much more reasonable interpretation of what Pachycetus looked like is shown in the lower right, and it obviously has nothing to do with a land animal turning into a whale. It's just looks typically like a four-footed land mammal. And so again, nothing at all like the original artist's rendition or the original gross extrapolation of the data. When we look at other famous claims of transitional forms, we see numerous other examples. One of them occurred in late 1990s, and this was Archaeoraptor, and the idea was to find or to demonstrate a transition between dinosaurs and birds. In other words, try to find evidence for a transitional forms showing that dinosaurs could somehow turn into birds. Evolutionists, of course, they have to somehow turn a bacteria into a human, and in the process of turning a bacteria into a human and also explaining how a bacteria could turn into all the other kinds of life forms that we see on Earth, in that process requires a tremendous number of transitional forms, and one that's important to evolutionists is to try to postulate a way that birds could have arisen, and a current favored theory is that somehow birds arose from dinosaurs, that somehow dinosaurs transitioned into birds. And so this was well known within the community, and there would be fossil hunters, and fossil hunters that were actually paid if they could find evidence for this kind of transition. Well, of course, once someone is paid to find a certain kind of information, and they know money could be made from this particular particular type of evidence or this particular line of evidence, and the scientists weren't even interested in any other kind of evidence. In other words, evidence that might support this theory, support this idea, was worth money. Evidence against that theory was not worth money. Well, of course, that skews the objectivity of the study. In other words, that leads to some very non-objective science at best. Unfortunately, in this case, it actually led to an outright fraud. And just the history, Archaeoraptor, again, October 15, 1999, it was put on display in National Geographic's Explorer Hall, and it was supposed to be a proof of a transitional form, proof that dinosaurs, of dinosaur to bird evolution. Taken off display in January 21st, 2000, but in the meantime, it was viewed by 110,000 people, mostly children, and of course, again, called a missing link. 
Featured as a cover story of National Geographic magazine in November of 1999, titled Feathers for T-Rex, but it's admitted to be a fraud in January 2000. And basically what had happened is a body and head of a bird had been combined with the tail of a dinosaur. And no evidence that the workers for National Geographic had committed the fraud, but evidence again that there was big money to be made by the people that did commit that fraud because a similar article was published in Nature a few months earlier. Now this particular fraud, a lot of times when a fraud or a transitional form is proposed and then someone later retracts it or says, well, we thought that was a transitional form, but it really wasn't a transitional form, a lot of times the public doesn't hear that. In other words, we'll just be bombarded on a daily or weekly or monthly basis with new transitional forums and new evidence here and new evidence there, just really trying to push this religion of evolution, just really trying to convince the public that evolution is true. When evidence becomes available or when additional study is done and they found that, well, what was thought to be a transitional form really had nothing to do with a transitional form or nothing to do with transitions, that usually at best has a very small retraction. A lot of times it's completely ignored and most of the time the general public will never know that that what was once touted as being a major transitional form had been refuted or had been since relegated to know just either variation with a kind, within a kind or perhaps a previously undiscovered species. Well, that wasn't the case here. This was such a, a blatant fraud it was so obvious what had happened to people that were willing to look at things objectively uh, that it generated a lot of publicity. Now, this is a quote from Storrs Olson. He's a curator of birds at the Natural Museum, Na National Museum of Natural History of the Smithsonian. And he said, the idea of feathered dinosaurs and the theropod origin of birds is being actively promulgated by a cadre of zealous scientists acting in concert with certain editors at Nature and National Geographic who themselves have become outspoken and highly biased proselytizers of the faith. Truth and careful scientific weighing of evidence have been among the first casualties in their program, which is now fast becoming one of the grander scientific hoaxes of our age, the paleontological equivalent of cold fusion. And so again, very harsh letter, and he's pointing out, he's not saying that these people are incompetent or uneducated. Uh, what he's saying is, is that they've become so interested in promoting their faith, promoting their faith that somehow dinosaurs turned into birds, that they're real, willing to really just even overlook the obvious. We saw that with the Piltdown Man, where again, obvious fraud, but it went undetected because it, it gave the conclusion that they desperately want to have or desperately want to find. So again, not questioning the competence of the individual in, involved, but a very serious question as to you know, why such an obvious fraud would go undetected. Now, it went even further. This was a, a fairly widely circulated letter, but in this case, the publicity surrounding this hoax went even further. We have here is the front page article in USA Today, and there were uh, front page articles in several major newspapers, again, uh, talking about this claimed transitional form that turned out to be a fraud. The headline says, the missing link that wasn't, and the subheadline says, a bird fossil is hailed as a major find until red-faced scientists discovered it was doctored. So again, in this particular example, good news was this fraud was very well exposed. Most of the people, uh, hopefully, that saw the fossil on display that went through the attempts to convince, to, for that fossil to be used to convince them that somehow dinosaurs had turned into, or the dinosaurs had turned into birds. Hopefully most of those people saw the retraction, realized that that had been refuted. But again, we can't get overconfident because that's not always the case. Again, many times when a transitional form is withdrawn, Christians won't hear about it. Individuals that were affected by it won't hear about it. Now, another interesting point, though, and perhaps this is the main point for this discussion, is a lot of times when we're looking at fossils, fossil record can be very ambiguous. It can be very small amounts of ever evidence. We look at two teeth or bone fragments or other very small fractions of an animal skeleton being used to try to reconstruct the entire animal or to try to develop some type of a story or some type of a idea about how, you know, maybe that again is a transitional form or what that animal looked like or other features of that particular animal. And a lot of times the pretense is made that that's the best science has to offer. In other words, if we ever really wanted to find out, did dinosaurs turn into birds, the only real method, the only real line of reasoning would be to go back and look at fossils and try to create transitional forms or identify certain bones that we find or certain species that we find as transitional forms. Well, true science can actually go far beyond that. And what we can look at is what would actually be needed? What would be required to turn a reptile into a bird? So in other words, if we're trying to turn dinosaurs into birds, what are some of the changes that would be needed? And what does true science tell us about those types of changes? Now, numerous changes would be required. We'd need changes in bone structures. We'd need changes in the way that the creature breathed. Uh, but we'll pick on right now, how do you get feathers? In other words, how do you take a reptilian scale? How do you turn a scale into a feather in some type of a 
reasonably plausible way. In other words, in some, how could a, just in the process of turning a dinosaur into a bird, how would we get scales to turn into feathers? And this could be, a, a, is, is a, actually a serious problem. It's not taught as such. Uh, one of the things that is taught, and this is actually in reading recommended by the National Academy of Sciences. National Academy of Sciences was commissioned to do a study called Teaching About Evolution and the Nature of Science. And the idea of that study, it's been several years now, but the idea behind that study was to give teachers ideas on how to indoctrinate students into evolution, how to encourage students to believe in evolution. Some of their recommended reading, uh, this quote is, feathers are modified reptilian scales. And so very simplistic, oh, okay, that's where feathers came from. They're just modified reptilian scales. Other sources of evolutionist literature will say that maybe scales became frayed, and those frayed scales somehow eventually turned into feathers. But if we look at feathers under a microscope, if we look at scales under a microscope, we see the tremendous difference between scales and feathers. We also see the incredibly intricate design of feathers. Feathers have barbs and barbules and hooks very sophisticated de design features to allow them to function properly. And so to say that a feather could just randomly generate itself from a scale, again, what we know about true science is that that's not going to happen. That's not credible. Other features, though, feathers originate from follicles inside the skin, totally different than the way scales originate. So again, it's not just modifying a scale or fraying a scale or somehow having a scale change its design to become a feather. Even just the very way that scales and feathers originate are completely different. Uh, feathers require significant new and different genetic information. As we've shown, there's no source for this new information, and it's very difficult to postulate transitional forms. In other words, if an animal that uses scales, has scales, is designed uh, for scales, to somehow try to turn that scale into a feather and make every intermediate, every transition somehow have a huge survival advantage as the evolutionists would propose, even that alone without getting into the biochemical impossibilities, even that alone is, is extremely difficult to postulate. We also know that feather proteins are biochemically different than skin and scale proteins. So again, just we have better evidence than just looking at fossils. We have better lines of reasoning than just saying, can we have a fossil that somehow looks like a dinosaur trying to turn into a bird? We can apply true science in other areas to show that no, reptiles, dinosaurs will not turn into birds. We go back to some of the transitional forms and probably the holy grail of transitional forms would be somehow turning a ape into a human, looking for transitional forms from apes to humans. And a very highly publicized potential transitional form or transitional form proposed by evolutionists uh, in recent years has been Lucy. And Lucy was touted again as a transitional form, started being uh, highly publicized in about 1974, called Man's Oldest Ancestor. Very many uh, fanciful depictions in many natural history museums. A lot of natural history museums talk about Lucy. One thing that's interesting, though, is when we look at the fossil evidence, it looks very much like an ape. But when we look at the depictions in museums, the sculptures that are in museums, what it really looks like is that they took the body of a human, added a bunch of hair to that human's body, and then stuck, stuck the head of an ape on top of that body. And so, again, not even the depictions now that we see in many museums have nothing to do with the fossil evidence. This, again, goes back to the, the quote about, is it okay to use an artist's rendition or an artist's conception of what a transitional form might have looked like? When questioned, some of these museums will say, well, we could have used the real fossils, but that doesn't convey the idea that we were hoping to convey. Well, again, the point is, what they are saying is they've already believed that evolution is fact, and since they, in their minds, know that evolution is fact, even if they need to change the evidence to present that, they're willing to, just to convey that type of information, which, again, very, completely non-scientific, very consistent with evolution being the false religion it is. Well, let's read a few quotes related to Lucy, and this is, again, evidence that's available as of fairly recently. The hyoid bone is exactly like that of a chimpanzee. The vocalization that the creature would be capable of would be like a chimpanzee's. The organ of balance is chimp-like and not human-like. The excellent preservation of the material makes this conclusion reliable. The neck vertebrae are short and thick like a gorilla. A slender neck, as humans have, helps to keep the head stable while running. The fingers are long and curved like a chimpanzee's. These facilitate climbing ability. While this has been seen in other australopithecine specimens, the relevance is still a matter of debate. The shoulder blades are the same as a gorilla's and not at all like a human's. The cranial capacity falls in the range of a chimpanzee's. Also, in, 19, or in 2007, issue of the Proceedings of National Academy of Science, Alophorensis was said to not be our ancestor at all, has a lower jawbone or mandible that closely resembles that of a gorilla, not that of a human or even a chimp. More recently, the Eda fossil was also proposed as a potential transitional form, but Eda only lasted a couple of days. And one of the 
possible reasons behind this is that the publicity surrounding EDA was completely over the top. Uh, headlines were reading, uh, world-renowned scientists reveal a revolutionary scientific find that will change everything. And a lot of uh, buildup for uh, at least 24 to 48 hours before any pictures or any detailed discussion of the fossil was actually made. And when the detailed uh, pictures or pre presentation of the fossil was made, it was, it was kind of a, a no big deal. And it was so uh, over the top, at least the amount of publicity that was generated, that even some organizations, some media outlets that are traditionally very pro-evolution, very sympathetic to evolutionists, uh, even they criticized the way EDA was handled, criticized a lot of the claims that were being made about EDA. Let me go ahead and read a couple of quotes there also. It says, the press releases were followed by an international press conference at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, the publication of a book, The Link, Uncovering Our Earliest Ancestor, an ABC News exclusive, and on May 25th, a primetime television special on the History Channel. Of the avalanche of media-related promotion, Jorn Hrum, a Norwegian paleontologist involved in Ida's discovery, told the New York Times, any pop band is doing the same thing. Another quote, from the beginning, Ida's unveiling has been a master class in Ballyhoo. And so again, organizations that are typically very pro-evolution uh, were really criticizing this particular attempt to claim a missing link as, as just being ballyhoo, as just being uh, kind of over-the-top publicity, similar to what you would see with a, a rock band. And indeed, uh, when looking further at the evidence, we find that EDA really has uh, nothing to do with any kind of a transition between apes and humans, and even any kind of no real significance evidence, even at, at proposed transitions below that stage. Kind of tongue in cheek, but using the same logic that's used by evolutionists, how should we view a duckbill platypus? And a question could be is the duckbill platypus a transitional form to and from everything? And the reason we could ask that question is if we look at a duckbill platypus, it has fur, milk glands, leathery egg, echolocation ability, a duckbill, web fish, poison spurs, and other shared features. So the question is well, with all of these shared features, all these features from different types of animals, how did it come about? What transitioned to a duckbill platypus, is that, if that were how it came about? And does that mean it transitioned to all kinds of other different animals? Well, of course, evolutionists don't talk about duckbill platypus. They don't talk about a lot of animals that would be very hard to postulate any kind of a transitional form to that animal. And of course, in the fossil record, we see duckbill platypuses appear fully formed, nearly identical to the type of duckbill platypuses that are alive today. And so, the fossil evidence, again, very consistent with duckbill platypuses being fossilized when their habitat was destroyed at that stage of the flood, but completely inconsistent with them somehow developing or evolving from a previous form of life or some previous transitional form. So really, the only true question in this area related to transitional forms is what transitional forms will be proposed next? And we need to be prepared for that because, again, if we follow the popular media, watch, read popular magazines, watch television programs. Transitional forms are a very popular subject with evolutionists. They'd like to push transitional forms, again, as a claim that somehow this is showing evidence for evolution. Again, when we look at transitional forms, they're much more consistent with variation in the kind. The kind, original created kind has tremendous variability. Transitional forms of things proposed as transitional forms, very consistent with variation within the kind, but also very consistent with sometimes with new kinds of animals or new uh, yet undiscovered animals or species that were, uh, were extinct uh, during the flood or, or shortly after the flood. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about some additional ambiguous arguments that are often used by evolutionists. And this is the idea of homologous structures. And what a homologous structure is, that's a structure that is similar between humans and, say, another type of animal. And so in homologous structures are, are typically discussed. And they can be between different kinds of animals also. But when a homologous structure is discussed, what's usually said is that, well, since the, say, the bones in, in a human's arm might have some similarities with the legs in a dog or the leg of a horse, that some of those similarities indicate that all types of animals arose from a common ancestor or that some kinds of animals turned into other kinds of animals because that would lead to, or one would expect to see similarities if that had actually occurred. Now, I'll read a few uh, quotes on this particular subject. The first quote, this is from the Department of Zoology at the University of British Columbia. It says, this observation makes little sense for created objects since a creator could mix and match features observed in any organism. And what's interesting about this quote is it really shows the religious nature of the debate because not trying to develop a scientific logic or scientific reasoning to why 
similar structures, similar features would have to mean that one animal turned into another animal. They're trying to attack the Christian perspective that would say, well, these similarities exist because God created all life, which of course from a Christian perspective is very consistent, very logical, but trying to attack that. And so in their opinion, they're saying that creator could mix and match features observed in any organism and therefore it makes little sense to have homologous structures and created objects. Well, again, that, of course, that's that person's religious viewpoint. That's that person thinking what they think God should do or how God would act. But again, it's, it's not a scientific argument. It's just a, a particular religious belief. Now, if we look at some of the more popular biology textbooks, some of the quotes in those, homologous structures are similar because they are modified versions of structures that occurred in a common ancestor. So very matter of fact statement, uh, defining homologous structures, saying that these Structures are similar because they occurred in a common ancestor. Other quotes, the similarity of these early developmental forms strongly suggests that the process of development has evolved. Another quote, what other evidence is there for evolution? And we see this quote a lot. What other evidence is there for evolution? In other words, the student is encouraged, no matter what they see, to try to interpret that as being evidence for evolution. It's not encouraging objective thinking. Again, encouraging the student, whatever they look at, to somehow view it as evidence for evolution. But anyway, it starts out, what other evidence is there for evolution? If later life forms evolve from earlier ones, wouldn't the later life forms have something in common with the earlier forms? Early life forms are made of cells, so are later life forms. Early life forms have DNA as part of their chromosomes, so do later life forms. Now, from a biblical creation standpoint, again, we would expect similarities between organisms because God created all life. And with a common designer, with one God creating all life on earth, we would expect to see these similarities. But we can go a step further, show that homologous structures actually show just the incredible engineering, the incredible design that goes into life. And with that incredible engineering and with that incredible design, God uses some of the same techniques for different life forms. And so what we would view as homologous structures or what an evolutionist would view as homologous structures indicating that some types of life turned into other types of life, what a Christian could view that as is just, again, the evidence of just the incredible intelligence, just the uh, omniscience of God, the omnipotence of God. Uh, read one quote. This is from Dr. Gary Parker. It says, as with yolk sac, gill slit formation represents an ingenious and adaptable solution to a difficult engineering problem. How can a small round egg cell be turned into an animal or human being with a digestive tube and various organs inside a body cavity? The answer is to have the little ball or flat sheet in some organisms swallow itself, forming a tube which then buds off other tubes and pouches. The anterior pituitary, lungs, urinary bladder, and parts of the liver and pancreas develop in this way. In fish, gills develop from such processes, and in human beings, the ear canals, parathyroid, and thymus glands develop. Following DNA instructions in their respective egg cells, fish and human beings each use a similar process to develop their distinctive features. So again, it's talking about incredibly creative engineering that God has used to be able to tell a, a fertile, to be able to have a fertilized egg develop into a full-grown complex organism. Now, other questions that we can ask ourselves on this subject, good first question would be, why do different car models from the same company have similarities? Well, of course, the reason they have similarities is they come from the same car company, and we would expect with the same designer, with the same engineers, the same creators, for those models to have similarities. Why do paintings from the same artist have similarities? If you know a person that's very interested in art, a lot of times they could go into a museum and look at different paintings, and just from the features of the painting, just from some of the design, some of the attributes of the paintings, they could tell which artist made which paintings. Same is true for music. If someone is a, a music fan, again, the the artist that, that makes the songs, the individual writing the songs, the individual singing the songs, people that are very into music can tell, given just a few notes, who wrote that song or who sung that particular song. And so again, uh, what we see in our everyday experience is that when we see these similarities, it's because of a common designer or because the same individual or the same company is, is working on what we're looking at. We see that uh, with functions also. We could ask why are similar parts used to perform similar functions. Wheels are used when we want to reduce friction, when we want something to be able to roll. Two by fours can be used to provide structure in a lot of applications. So again, similarities, not evidence that one thing is turning into another thing, evidence of a common designer, evidence of a common creator. So observations on this point, similarities expected if God created all life on Earth. That's exactly what we would expect. But it's not unreasonable to say similarities would exist if life evolved from a common ancestor. So in other words, in this case, we know that homologous structures are very consistent with biblical creationism, but we have to admit that it also would be consistent if different types of animals turned into other types of animals. And so that's why we call this an ambiguous argument. Although this particular argument is used very frequently by evolutionists because it's very 
difficult. It's not as easy or concrete or technically uh, you know, provable to be false. Because again, it's, it is reasonable if, if animals really did turn into each other. You know, if uh, tricycles really did turn into airplanes, then that would be one explanation why tricycles have wheels and airplanes have wheels. That certainly doesn't mean tricycles do turn into airplanes, but it would be consistent if somehow they did uh, for them both to have wheels. Hebrews 11:6. and without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Other observations, theory of evolution is contrived such that no matter what the evidence, a superficial explanation exists, and experiments to falsify the theory cannot be devised. This in itself makes the theory non-scientific. An example here is homologous structures defined as similar structures that have a common ancestry, analogous structures defined as features of organisms that are similar but have evolved independently. So again, if we see similarities, we're told that that's evidence for evolution. If we see there is, if we use true science and we find that there is potentially some genetic link between two organisms, we say that, well, that obviously means that one organism turned into the other organism. But if we see evidence where there's no way those similarities could have been genetically linked, in other words, we see similarities but no way to make any kind of genetic link whatsoever, then we just claim that they evolved independently. But either way, again, we're being encouraged to view any type of evidence that we see as evidence for evolution, which again makes this theory non-scientific. I want to briefly conclude with just a few evidences, a little bit of discussion about other topics. One is the potential effects of the Genesis flood. We know that the global flood would be extremely catastrophic and that that flood would give extensive geologic changes and activities. And so the pre-flood world itself would have been very different from the post-flood world. For example, continents would have been different, mountains would have been different, rivers would have been different, uh, climate would have been different. And we can see evidence for this. We've seen small floods, uh, such as the floods that occurred following the Mount St. Helens eruption, but we've also seen medium-sized floods. I believe medium-sized floods were responsible for forming the channel channeled scablands in the northwestern United States. Uh, we've also seen the evidence of what can be accomplished with large floods. Many individuals now feel that the Grand Canyon was carved by a large flood. Evolutionists have an explanation of how that would happen on their time scale. Of course, biblically, we know that, that could be a result of the Genesis flood. And a, a global flood could have even uh, just tremendous effects. And so that's uh, one of the effects we'll talk about will be the Ice Age. Uh, but we see other evidence uh, associated with the global flood. We see a worldwide die-off of marine life. We see a lot of evidence for volcanic activity as implied in Genesis 7:11. Some of that evidence, for example, we see osmium in uh, shale oil. And so this volcanic activity uh, not only could be war would be warming the oceans, would also allow for the fountains of the great deep, would also explain what we see with uh, marine fossils being in the lower layers of the, the fossil record. Immersion of all land is talked about in Genesis 7, 19 through 20 and, and elsewhere. Sure enough, we see marine fossils on top of mountains, very uh, consistent there. We see uh, fossil graveyards, example, uh, red wall limestone, Green River Formation in Wyoming, Fossil Bluff in Tasmania, where again, these graveyards, just this huge agglomeration of fossils covering vast, densest, uh, vast areas, but very dense fossil depositions. And we see those all over the world. Again, very consistent with a global flood. We see uh, curved and bent strata. And these are strata, if you look in the picture in the upper left, this strata has been bent, uh, but it's a, it's a smooth bend, and so there's no sign of any kind of cracking, and that implies that, that bend had to occur while the rock was still soft. If you take a piece of that rock, rub it between your fingers, it will crumble. So it's very brittle. And so the fact that we see these smooth bends indicates that, again, that those uh, strata, and many times representing to evolutionists, very long periods of time, evidence that that strata had to be laid down extremely quickly, and that, again, consistent with a, a global flood. But we also see cross bedding, uh, evidence for rapid transport and, and burial. The cross bedding is consistent with an underwater flow moving at, at a very high velocity, at least for the depths that would be required. And then, of course, the uh, preservation of fossils also very consistent. Uh, rapid uplifting before certain formations had time to weather, all consistent with a global flood. Now, I want to talk very briefly about another potential effect of the flood, and that would be the ice age. Now, What's interesting is very hard to trigger an ice age. If the temperature on Earth just begins to drop, if the Earth's temperature just starts to cool down, all that will do is cause the Earth to become a cold desert. Uh, we won't get an ice age because there's no, no source of moisture. That's why in Antarctica, other very cold regions, they get very little snow because, again, there's no real source of moisture. And so what an ice age would require would be very warm oceans coupled with very cold air over the land masses. Now, that's a very reasonable result, a very reasonable expectation of what could have happened after the Genesis flood. Genesis 7-11 says, fountains of the great deep burst open and the floodgates of the sky were open. 
And so a biblically consistent theory associated with the Ice Age could say that superheated water and volcanic activity during the flood resulted in an increase in average ocean temperature, perhaps to as high as 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Residual volcanic ash in the atmosphere reduced sunlight. Warm water provided a moisture source for intense snowstorms over the cold land masses leading to the Ice Age. Now, what's interesting also is although this is a credible model, using climate models this would result in an Ice Age, there are, again are no credible, no uh, acceptable uniformitarian models for the Ice Age. There are a lot of ideas out there on how an uh, Ice Age could be triggered uh, uni using uniformitarian models, and they all rely on these very subtle cycles, very subtle variations, but none of them are significant enough, none of those variations, to actually trigger ice ages. And so that's a, an area where, again, the Bible gives us true knowledge. The Bible gives us a very good idea of what could have happened, and secular scientists have unable to be, to, been unable to devise acceptable theories. Uh, very quickly, biblically, the flood would have started uh, shortly, I'm sorry, the ice age would have started shortly after the flood, around 2300 BC, probably would have ended by 1700 BC, been fairly short-lived. Relatively warm, unglaciated areas would be expected near the coast. Again, that's exactly what the evidence implies. We see woolly mammoths uh, that used to live near the Arctic Ocean. A lot of remains of woolly mammoths uh, in northern areas that today would be impossible for woolly mammoths to survive in. There's just not enough food. What food there is uh, is, is locked up in ice. Uh, the majority of the year is, is frozen in the tundra. But we, we do find their remains. So we know the climate had to be significantly different. We know that if there were warm oceans next to those areas, that that would be a way for that climate too exists that would allow, for example, the woolly mammoths to live there. But we also see uh, evidence that hippos used to live in England. So again, evidence that a lot of these coastal areas uh, were very warm, consistent with the biblical model of having very warm oceans and cold air over the land. Uh, also see uh, evidence for a significantly different climate in the deserts. We see desert art. Uh, we see evidence of advanced civilizations in regions where rainfall maybe only occurs every few years or, or sometimes even less than that. And so, for a civilization to develop in those areas would be di very difficult. But again, we see evidence with desert art of advanced civilizations. With ground penetrating radar, though, we also see that there's evidence that water actually flowed in those regions fairly recently. And that was a surprise. That was a surprise that we found in the early 1980s. Again, very consistent with a, a drastically different climate following the flood, uh, a different uh, climate um, you know, following the flood and, and, and during the particular ice age. Uh, biblical evidence uh, talks about from whose womb has come the ice and the frost of heaven, who has given it birth? That's Job 38, 29. That's when God is talking about some of the amazing things he has done. And so it's interesting that he mentions has come the ice. Some, some scholars feel that that could, uh, uh, that could be representative of the ice age, talking about glaciers. Also, Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the valley of the Jordan that was well watered everywhere, Genesis 13, 10. Again, evidence that some of the areas that look very barren today may have uh, previously, shortly after the flood, appeared very well watered, uh, very, uh, you know, much, much lesser than they are today. Other effects, the ice, the water being locked up in glaciers, that water being locked up in glaciers could have reduced sea level. That could have allowed the um, Oceans drop enough to create land bridges, allow people to disperse after the Tower of Babel, also allow animals to fill the earth as they were, uh, as God intended after the flood had ended. And during that time, uh, certain features such as caves would have provided an excellent source of shelter for people. And by living in those caves, though, and with a different climate, it would also have been an explanation for why we see uh, reduced sunlight and potentially poor diet that could have caused skeletal deformities that could have led to some of the uh, skeletons that we find today. Uh, finally, at the end of the Ice Age, catastrophic flooding at the end of the age, responsible for many geologic features. Uh, freezing of northern oceans resulted in much colder temperatures and extinction of many species. So again, uh, just talking a little bit about potential effects of the flood, potential effects of the Ice Age. We, uh, a lot more discussion that we could have, uh, could ask questions such as how much technology did Noah's world have? Again, Noah could have had tremendous technology. It had been over 1,650 years from creation to the flood. It's a common language worldwide, and the brains of people then were much closer to perfect as originally created by God. Uh, and again, numerous other questions that, that could be asked. But we need to wrap up this session, and we'll continue in the next session with discussions related to age. This has been a presentation of Apologetics Press, an organization dedicated to the defense of New Testament Christianity. Visit us on the web at apologeticspress.org or call 800-234-8558.